All right. We're going to go right. ahead and get started. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to A Cup of Hope with Hope Against Trafficking and the Michigan Abolitionist Project. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few things so you know how to participate in today's event. You're listening and using your computer's speaker system by default. If you would prefer to join over the phone, just select telephone in the audio pane and the dial-in information will be displayed. You will have the opportunity to submit text questions to our panel by typing your questions into the questions pane of the control panel. You may send in your questions at any time during the presentation, and we will collect these and address them towards the end of the session. Now I'd like to go ahead and welcome today's panelists. We have Tracy Cavelligan, who is the Executive Director for Hope Against Trafficking, Hannah McPeak, the Education Director for Hope Against Trafficking, we have Emily Johnson, Program Coordinator at Michigan Abolitionist Project, and we're very proud to welcome our guest panelist today, Clarence Doss of the Doss Law Firm. For nearly five years, Clarence served as Assistant Prosecuting Attorney at the Oakland County Prosecutor's Office, one of the nation's top prosecutor's offices. There, he prosecuted thousands of crimes, tried cases to judges and juries, and gained experience at all levels of the criminal justice system. He has appeared in every district court in Oakland County and handled cases all throughout the Oakland County Circuit Court. Because of his early success, work ethic, and passion for the law, he was promoted to the Special Victims Section of the Prosecutor's Office. As a special prosecutor, he handled the most complex and serious crimes in Oakland County, ranging from child and elder abuse to sexual assault, domestic violence, and murder. By the time Clarence left the prosecutor's office, he had worked in, with virtually every police agency, probation department, and court system in Oakland County. Since leaving the prosecutor's office, he has handled several high-profile cases in Michigan and throughout the country. He is an active member of the Oakland County Bar Association and frequently speaks on various topics throughout the legal community. He is licensed to practice in all courts in the state of Michigan, federal court, and the Supreme Court of the United States. Clarence also believes that service to the community does not stop at the courtroom doors. He has undertaken various community and leadership initiatives aimed at improving the quality of life around the, of those around him. In 2017, he was named one of Oakland County Executive's Elite 40 Under 40. He was president of the 27th Class for Leadership Oakland, where he helped spearhead the rehabilitation of one of Hope Against Trafficking's homes. In 2018, he received Leadership Oakland's Leader of Leader Awards for Exemplary Public Leadership. Um, he is also an advocate for cancer patients and survivor. A cancer survivor himself, he serves on the advisory board to Gilder's Club of Metro Detroit. His mission is to advocate for those who are voiceless and provide legal help to those who need it most. Parents is currently running for Oakland County Circuit Court Judge and the seat currently held by Judge Alexander, whose term expires on December 31st. The election will be on November 3rd. Thank you so much. That's what a generous, that's a very generous, it's very uncomfortable to hear all of that out loud. So I appreciate it. <laughs> wow, we're so, so glad so, to have you, Clarence. I don't feel worthy to be on this panel with you, Clarence. <laughs> no, 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 no. Well, welcome. But I appreciate it. Yeah. Uh, how's everybody been doing since last week? We missed you last week, Emily. Well, I'm not a parent, so I figured you guys would do... <laughs> You're just fine without me. <laughs> well, it's been a good week. A good active week. Can't complain. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, hopefully the internet will stay in place. Uh, Emily's already lost power. We've lost internet here at the Murphy at uh, you know against trafficking offices. So hopefully we'll be able to to handle this uh, webinar without any technical problems. Yeah. If my but, screen goes um, black, you know what happened. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We won't take it personally. The clerics don't take any of this personally. We all disappear from the screen. <laughs> right. So, um, well, to kind of give the audience who maybe haven't been registered in our past um, webinars, we've had uh, a three-week series on pornography. And um, last week we, um, we talked about how to talk to your children and that's why emily decided that she without having children she was going to just be a wife <laughs> <laughs> on how to talk to our children about porn which is a very serious subject which got us to thinking about you know how porn is legal and the negative consequences of this um on our society 
families, on our own personal psyche. Um, we thought that we'd um, ask Clarence to come and talk to us and with us about decriminalization versus legalization um, around um, prostitution and sex work and, and all that. So, um, Clarence, can you kind of lead us into what, um, so we know exactly what that is, so we can have a good discussion on it? <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. So thank you again for having me. You know, when, when we talk about decriminalization, we need to define kind of what we're talking about. And there's really two areas of the law that we're talking about. We're talking about, on the one hand, prostitution, uh, which is legal in all 49 states, you know, except for Nevada, 50 states rather, except for Nevada. And then, and then the other category is actual trafficking, human trafficking, sex trafficking, and things like that. And under the law, there are really two distinctions that separate the two of them. First is whether a third party is involved. So whether there's an actual pimp or oppressor or somebody that's facilitating, um, the sex work. And then the second is the concept of choice, which is kind of a complicated concept, but we'll talk about that. Um, mm -hmm. So generally, if it's, if it's involving a third party of you know, some sort, generally that's considered trafficking and not necessarily prostitution. So if somebody is forcing you or coercing you to do something, then you know, generally it's gonna be considered trafficking. And, I'm, and in addition to that, um, if you are, you know, choosing to commit the act yourself, that's going to be more in line with prostitution. Again, that's a complicated question, and there's people that disagree mm -hmm. with the idea of choice. We'll get into that. Mm -hmm. But it really comes down to whether the law views you as having been forced to do it. If you've been forced to do it, that is trafficking. And if you haven't been forced to do it by someone else, then it's prostitution. Both of them are illegal in, in, in a variety of states throughout the country. In Michigan, we didn't actually uh, criminalize trafficking until about 2006. Up until then, we used to have to use a hodgepodge of laws to prosecute. Um, I think we lost Emily for a minute, but she's come Hi. back, at least on my screen. Um, <laughs> yeah, I like just, what you had to say. <laughs> you're right. That's what I figured that from the beginning. Um, but in 2006, Michigan finally got on the, on the uh, trend of criminalizing trafficking. And prior to that, we used to have to use a hodgepodge of different uh, crimes like prostitution, kidnapping, and, and things like that, which made it very difficult as prosecutors to do. Um, and then in 2011, as trafficking became more of a hot topic among um, the country, around the country, um, we passed another series of laws that created restitution opportunities for um, you know, victims and survivors that allowed them for example, to get paid for medical costs for injuries. It allowed them to get paid for emotional distress. And interestingly, it allowed them to get paid for almost essentially every single day that they were trafficked, which was mm -hmm. a, a possibility before, uh, before that law mm -hmm. because there was no way to quantify that and there is a way to quantify that now. Mm -hmm. And then when I was a prosecutor in 2014, um, we had a whole slew of about 21 bills that came into law that really strengthened opportunities for law enforcement to criminalize trafficking. That made it a felony. It enhanced the opportunities for it to be a felony. So in Michigan, for example, um, it's a felony to traffic someone and it's a 10 year felony. If you injure somebody while you're trafficking them, it's a 15 year felony. And if you seriously injure somebody, and that is generally is defined as permanent uh, loss of life or permanent damage, it's a 20 year felony. And that incorporates all the other areas of the law. So there are no states throughout the country where prostitution or trafficking is legal or decriminalized, um, except Nevada, but even in Nevada, trafficking is still considered illegal. Um, mm. There's this debate among lawyers and philosophers and politicians even about whether there is in fact a distinction between trafficking and prostitution. Um, most people, you know, off the bat think that there is and that they use that by looking at the choice that a person makes. If you as a young woman choose to um, engage in sex work, then you are a prostitute. Others believe that you don't really have a choice in the first place and that you wouldn't actually be doing that kind of work, you know, if you really want, had a choice, but you're forced into it because of economic circumstances, social circumstances, 
or some of the other things that we look at when we look at human trafficking, which is blackmail, force, coercion, shame, for example, mm -hmm. uh, the mm -hmm. stigma of um, one time having sex and then feeling like that just destroyed your entire life, and all these other uh, factors. Child sexual I will abuse. Mention one, yeah, and I will mention one. Um, <laughs> Yeah, no, no, that's fine. I will mention one last aspect of the law that is uniform, whether it's trafficking or prostitution, which is when when it comes to minors. All across the country, if you're a minor, you, you can't be criminalized for uh, trafficking or prostitution at all. They don't consider you to have the ability to consent to even the choice of prostitution. So no matter what happens, if you're under 18, um, it is a crime and can be dealt with state by state. Well, we're digesting <laughs> <laughs> a lot of information, I know. Yeah. And Hannah took a lot of notes, I see. You got What's that? <laughs> I was I was typing up some notes. <laughs> oh yeah. Sorry, I was trying that stuff. But I, you know, I think that that is really helpful to set this up with understanding, you know, the difference between human trafficking and prostitution and what our law state. Um but now if we can move into talking about legalization versus decriminalization. So now that we've sort of got these definitions in place, now let's get a little bit deep, deeper and talk about this whole um, uh, sort of dissonant uh, issue here, uh, you know, talking about legalization versus decriminalization. What is the difference between the two? What does those mean? Well, when we talk about decriminalization what we're what we're really talking about is essentially reducing either reducing penalties for some people and enhancing penalties for other people so in in decriminalization we are we're looking at not punishing the people who don't have a choice in the matter so the people who are providing the services the people who are um engaging in the acts whether it's labor or sex that's decriminalizing legalizing is uh, a different debate that's going on in this country about prostitution and whether if we legalize prostitution, will that in fact reduce the demand for trafficking? Will it reduce the demand for uh, prostitution? Will it, will, it, will it change the landscape of how we enforce these types of things? There hasn't been a state throughout the country yet that has fully kind of decriminalized uh, the act. They still um, put some onus on um, the people who provide the services. Now in Michigan in 2014, we did pass what are called safe harbor provisions that allow um, the people for, who are providing the service to essentially be immune from full prosecution, but that doesn't mean they don't get arrested. They still get arrested. They still have to go through the process sometimes. They still have to talk to the police officer. They still have to do the prosecution interviews. I mean, you're putting them through the process still without actually charging them with a crime. And in some ways, that process is in itself a punishment because you're having to relive the experience yeah. over and over again. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but there is this debate that we, that we as lawyers are often looking at, which is whether actually um, legalizing marijuana, or uh, marijuana, actually, that's a whole depth of <laughs> conversation a lot of time on, uh, not actually legalize uh, prostitution, whether that's going to make an impact on trafficking and whether it's going to reduce it. I've done some research in this area, and there's really two models that, that scholars have looked at um, primarily. When one was done in actually in Australia, where they did, did decriminalize and legalize prostitution, and they did see a uh, reduction in trafficking, at least reported trafficking, throughout, throughout Australia. Um, here in the United States, uh, Chicago was a test model for um, trafficking, and they attempted to decriminalize certain aspects of it by providing immunity for um, the people who provide the uh, the uh, actual service itself. But what they actually noticed in Chicago, which goes back to what I was saying, is because you still have to go through the police interview and you still have to go through the arrest aspect of it, First of all, what they ended up seeing was some uh, police officers were actually having sexual relations with the people providing the services, and, and therefore still legal in Michigan, isn't it? Isn't that still legal in Michigan? Well, that's a that's a great question, and that was another change that happened when I was a prosecutor. It still is legal in Michigan, but what they've done in Michigan is give officers a 
an opportunity to get out of it in some ways by not actually having to commit the act. It's kind of crazy. They used to have to make you commit the act in order to prove that it happened. So you have to go through it, essentially lure them in or be in a situation where they're there, and then actually have sex with them. Um, in about 2016, they said you don't have to actually commit the act because that is harming everybody. In, a, in a sense, you're harming the person that you're trying to help in many ways uh, just to prove it. And then you're harming perhaps the police officer's family and people who have to deal with that person going home at night after having gone through these things. So, yeah, that's a whole different conversation, definitely. But um, Chicago has been the only place that's really been a test model for true de decriminalization, and they haven't seen the effect of reduction in trafficking that you know maybe we would want to or australia has seen for example because you're still dealing with people in the justice system yeah i would also mention because i've heard like sweden they changed their laws and um like prostitution is not acceptable in sweden and they they claim that they've they don't see it as often there but like the surrounding countries might have a bit more um, and then like places like Amsterdam where it's completely legal and they have the red light district, they, there have definitely been higher numbers of traffic victims coming from Amsterdam or to and from Amsterdam. Yeah, and well, one thing that's important, that... Go ahead. I, was, I was say one thing on top of that, that's a very important distinction here is what's actually being reported and what's not being reported because once when, when you mm -hmm. decriminalize in Sweden and Amsterdam and make it essentially a market or an economy or normal mm -hmm. you're not going to have high numbers being reported because number one there's nothing to report at that point so it looks like mm -hmm. things have gone down when then maybe mm -hmm. they've actually gone up on the trafficking front but there's no way to right. do prosecute anymore right. um, and on the right. other end on the other end um, if you still have and this is an argument people make to keeping it uh, criminal and, and illegal you give you give a framework for reporting, um, but then there's that's a double edged sword because if there if it's a crime, you don't want to report it because then you're going to have to deal with lawyers and prosecutors and police officers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I can understand that with Sweden, like if they say that it's illegal, um, so yeah, there'd probably be less reports of it. Or, um, but it was just interesting to me how they they framed it as. Um, prostitution is violence against women. That is, it is going to be illegal because it is considered violence against women, and we are, you know, we treat women equally as we do men here, and we're not going to tolerate that kind of thing. So I, it was just interesting that the way they framed it and the way that they went about it when putting it into into law. Emily, Absolutely. Emily, I think, and also too, we can't forget that we have um, our men and our boys who are trafficked and prostituted out oh, and we have yeah, that yeah, underlying yeah. with the with the you know the homosexual or the um you know the lbtq i can never get the LGBTQ. numbers but you know it's the letters but but there's a whole underworld that we don't even get yeah. and i and i yeah. think people forget about them because we don't get the reporting but there's even more shame. Mm -hmm. Not that it's just a lot of shame when you're a man mm -hmm. or a boy mm -hmm. and there and there's even statistics that um most that um, there's high statistics. I mean, there's statistics showing higher rates of death with the male prostitution um, industry, if you can call it industry. But you know that area. So um, that that's a shame, and I just don't want to forget that it's violence against people. Absolutely, absolutely. I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah, just point blank, it's it's violent. It's a violent, right. a very violent industry to work in, and legal or not and i think some people think that legalizing prostitution would make it safer and i think that's kind of there's some misconceptions there well and i'll make i'll mention this point you know i mentioned marijuana earlier which was a debate that we were having for many years you know among <laughs> prosecutors defense attorneys well we legalized marijuana and i will tell you you know one of the things that we've seen is that crime violent crime has gone up because now you've now created a, a huge different market for marijuana and so now, you know, you're you're dealing with people stealing more, committing more crimes, breaking into homes, and things like that to get access to some of these things that you that you would have had maybe maybe some barriers to before. It's the same when it comes to prostitution or sex trafficking because if you don't have the framework in place, then you don't, then uh, people get away with more. So so for example, mm -hmm. I was reading a study about a week ago that talked about how you know prostitutes who carry more condoms with them are at higher risk for 
of violence because people want a condom. So they, they may get assaulted for the condom. Again, this is now getting into like nuanced conversation about the aspects of decriminalization, things like that. But this, these are the kinds of things that people are talking about when it comes to this stuff. Um, it's violent for all. When you're, when you're doing things that are not mainstream in society's mm -hmm. you know, eyes, mm -hmm. there's always going to be opportunities for abuse in, in an already abusive practice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good points. So are there other questions? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We're just digesting. This is such a serious conversation. What happens is you have people who support legalizing it. You actually have people in the industry, sex workers, who say, we have the right to do it. And then you have all of the victims and you have all of these issues, like you even bring up with marijuana. People don't want to look at the whole picture. They just want to look at a small picture. I mean, you even see it with the coronavirus, right? It's like everyone wants to look at the small picture and not the big picture. And so everyone starts getting on sides without really debating it. And I think it's really important um, that we talk about the consequences if it is legalized or what it looks like when it's decriminalized. And one of the things that I get concerned about is if it is um, legalized, um, you know, and I think um, I touched a little bit about it when we're when Emily brought up Sweden and Amsterdam. We lose the the ability to actually be able to go out there and help those who are trafficked because the reporting goes down. Um, we can't get out there and really, um, uh, you know, go out there and help when we might have a lot of people say, "Well, there's no problem now. You know, they can get out of it. There's a choice. Um, it's legal." Mm -hmm. So. You know, I mean, so like people just don't think it through, and I think it's because more so they just don't have the information, uh, you know, and so that's the purpose of us to give like a cup of hope, right, Hannah? Of like, there's hope that people will understand this issue. I know you had a lot more questions, Hannah. I can't remember what was the other one that you were yeah. talking about. We covered a lot of it actually just in this, in what we've talked about so far, but one of the things I wanted to ask you was given uh, the amount of years and the time that you've seen and, and, and as an expert, do you feel like there is enough empirical data and research and evidence um, out there with, with either decriminalization versus legalization that we, we that there's enough data that, that we as a country can begin having like an actual, like can make decisions on what they, what, what we need to do? Well, I don't think there is. And, you know, I mentioned Chicago. When I was doing my research, Chicago is one of the only places in the entire country that's actually done a comprehensive study on this. And, and even that was pretty recent. But if you look at our country and how long it takes sometimes for um, Congress to kind of get up to speed on topics, I mean, we didn't even have the Violence Against Women Act until 1994, yet Violence Against Women was going on, I think, long before 1994. Um, we didn't even decide human trafficking was a crime until 2006. And we, we've just kind of started talking about it. We just got past, I think, the phase where it was kind of like a, you know, a pop culture topic to talk about. So when the Super Bowl started talking about it, you know, I remember mm -hmm. I made a comment a couple of years ago where the Super Bowl, you know, is one of the most coveted places to have ads. And um, you pay millions and millions of dollars to have an ad. And it was such a big deal one year to have a, a human trafficking ad. Um, around the Super Bowl. Well, when did they put the ad on? They put it on right after halftime when people are taking their bathroom breaks and moved on and getting their re their stocking of food. So, you know, hardly anyone saw the ad. When Tracy mentioned a point that I want to kind of come back to about um, the legalization versus not, and she mentioned coronavirus and I mentioned marijuana. When I, when I often talk to juries, you know, I, I try a case to a jury and I will often have juries and jurors that will come up to me afterward and will, and I'll, Sometimes they'll find, find someone not guilty when I was prosecuting them, or sometimes they'll find them guilty. And I'll, I'll ask them, you know, why is it that you chose the way you did? And oftentimes in the case of, uh, you know, when they find someone not guilty, um, and in fact, one time I even showed them a video of an actual assault happening, and they still found the person not guilty of the assault. I would go in there and I would say, you know, what's the story here? Why did this happen? And generally, I heard this response. Well, why did she? Why did she go to the party? Why did she make the phone call? Why did she? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that I think the debate comes down to a moral debate versus an economic debate when we talk about mm -hmm. criminalization. 
People are mm-hmm. not going to view sex as a moral thing, even even post Me Too, even after the Me Too movement, it's still something that we deal with. And in some ways, the Me Too movement actually hurt some efforts that we were having because what happened is the general public thought a lot of people were crying wolf. And then when the real cases were coming out, you know, mm-hmm. what I mean, we would we would try to prosecute these cases to a jury, and they would mm-hmm. think, well, this person, this one in a hundred case, lied about it. So therefore, this must be everybody. We got to we have heightened scrutiny for him. That's mm-hmm. the moral conversation we always hear about, which is, you know, we're blaming the person that's the that's committing the act. She shouldn't have done it. There should have been a way out of it. She shouldn't have, you know, had she could have gone to work at McDonald's. I always hear that she could have gone to work at McDonald's versus, you know, go to, uh, you know, uh, se- the sex field um, versus the economic conversation that a lot of people have when it comes to legalizing, which is, hey, look at Amsterdam. They're making money from the red light district. Look at, we can put a tax on it. We can do all these things. And I think that every, you know, more, every debate that we have around decriminalization of anything has one group of people on the moral discussion of it, which is no matter what we're going to say to them, they're going to believe this is a wrong thing. And, you know, the last, the least sympathetic people are going to be prostitutes and drug dealers and all these other people that society views as bad. And then there's the people on the other end, which is uh, the people that just won recently in the marijuana debate, which is, hey, we can, it's not so bad, we can make money off of it. But I think that when it comes to the sex industry, there's always going to be an aspect of it that is bad because you are dealing with um, long-term damage to people's lives and you're dealing with a psychology that even if we do decriminalize it, you're going to have people harmed forever from it. Yeah. That's why I do worry about it because I feel like the government is kind of, well, I probably shouldn't say the government, but there is a lot of money tied up in it and it, there is money to be earned and gained from it. And so that worries me that, it, I mean, we, what was it last year? We, there was legislation we had to fight in Washington, DC. Um, um, yeah. So. Well, and the yeah. thing is, too, and I, and I, I know this isn't a very popular point, but I like I want to make it because um, when we look, start looking at decriminalization and legalization, and you start looking at who uses the prostitutes or the young girls, you see that there are normal people in society. There are senators, there are pastors, there are business leaders, there are lawyers, or doctors. So everyone wants to think that people who use prostitutes are just people who are seedy themselves. But in essence, a lot of the people who use them and abuse these women are people who are not who will probably vote for legalization, you know, because they're mm-hmm. thinking themselves. You know what I mean? So you have that selfish tendency with our Johns, and that's why I think, uh, you know, it's really always having to go after the demand. You know, yeah. I mean. You know, when we have these conversations, we're always going to be going back to, well, how can we prevent it initially? You know, how can we just stop it? Doesn't matter if it's legal or not, or can we stop this? Because like you said, Clarence, it's just so negative. No matter what, it's, it affects families, it affects your own personal body, your mind, your soul, your spirit, it affects society, it affects our children. I mean, it's just, it's just so negative when you look at the full picture. Right. And I think the point that uh, Hannah had made about data is very important because I started off that initial point by saying we don't have the data and, and I don't think we're going to have the data for a while because I, I because of that moral issue, which is this isn't this isn't the hottest topic, you know, for people to feel bad about. People feel bad about um, topics that they can tangibly touch and that they feel like it affects them. But when it comes to the sex industry, you know, we're thinking of it as a, you know, areas in big cities where you, it's at nighttime, it's on corners. I mean, that's the traditional way of looking at this. When mm-hmm. Jeffrey Epstein's case brings to light a whole different perception of this thing, which is, hey, mm-hmm. the, the leader of this country may have done this, or these, these business people or international networks are doing it. And so yeah. with each case that unfortunately has to happen, we move closer and closer to more data. And, you know, the Epstein case did open up a whole new uh, subset for data, but it's going to take more, unfortunately, for people to care enough about it that they don't think this is the underbelly of society. Yeah. And and I think you're, I think you make a good point. Is there some articles that I've read that talk about how 
you know, how can you make laws based on moral opinions and moral uh, or moral compass? Um, mm -hmm. And there's a lot of different opinions on that. Um, and when I was looking at some of the research, there's been a lot of references back to research that's been done in the 1970s as early as the 1950s. So th this issue of prostitution and this moral issue and this issue of sex work has been a topic for quite some time now. Mm -hmm. But but there's this whole sort of new layer that um, impacts uh, the way that law enforcement can then respond. It impacts the way the demand is responding. It impacts the way um, the victim or uh, or not uh, is impacted. So, the, I mean, there's just so many layers that have to be unpacked, and it makes sense. I just said, because, man, I mean, looking at stuff, I can't, I, there's stuff that's been done and data collected since so many, many, many years ago. So... Yeah, and there's one, there's one other. We gotta, get this, we gotta get ourselves together here. Like, what? This is human life. Like, why well, we're not investing more? But of course, mm -hmm. this is it's just me, right? I'm just, I'm just experience. I'm just like having these emotions and these feelings. And I know, you know, one of the other big things is don't just um, read one thing and then just make a decision on something, right? This is a lot more involved. There's so many layers that are involved in. Um, in this, you can't possibly um, be like, oh, well, I believe this because of this, or I, I'm going to go with decriminalization because of these two articles that I read, you know? You, you yeah. can't. You just can't do that. And so it's almost like sort of a, hey, everybody who's listening, just make sure that you're doing a lot of research and looking at both sides of the story because it isn't just black and white. It really isn't. And it's a hard, sometimes it's a hard conversation to have, but these are good mm -hmm to create spaces like this to have dialogue about these issues and get people thinking and get people considering, um, I think we'll have a better chance as a, as a society um, navigating mm -hmm. this. Real quick, yeah. I, I will say like, okay, go ahead, Claire, sorry. No, you go ahead, you go ahead, go ahead. I was just gonna say like, I've, in the research I've done, like something that's definitely stuck out to me is just hearing like testimonies from the women who've worked in the industry. And that was just the most compelling thing for me to read and kind of formed a lot of my opinions on the sex industry and decriminalization and all that. Yeah, and one thing I think is a barrier to, to the legalization, decriminalization conversation is the idea of victims you know in order to have a something be a crime there needs to be a victim because that's the only way that the justice system can have a complaining witness you have to have somebody complain to authorities to uh create a crime in the first place and many people don't feel that prostitution is a victim crime in fact sometimes it's considered a victimless crime because who's really being harmed here someone's gaining something in terms of a service mm -hmm. and the other person is performing the service. But that's one end of the debate. And the other end of the debate that moves toward um, the criminalization aspect of it is that prostitution is always a victim crime and the person being victimized is the person providing the service. So one thing that practically has to happen before we get to, you know, an actual change in the laws is we need to have a uniform definition of whether this is a victimless crime mm -hmm. or not. And mm -hmm. to get people, and, and that, that kind of goes to the same debate we've been having, which is, is this person doing it by choice or not? In my opinion, every crime in some ways has a victim, even if it's a financial crime. If you're committing the crime, you are in fact victimizing yourself uh, because mm -hmm. you're committing a crime. Mm -hmm. um, but it's not as easy to define that in the legislature. And I will tell you, it's very hard to define that to a jury. When we have um, you know, crimes that we're trying to prosecute, where we are talking about, you know, an, you know, a drug crime, for example, marijuana. You know, somebody has a confidential informant and they go and do a drug bust and the person gets caught. No one got hurt in that scenario. No one, you know, you can't really tangibly, you know, prosecute someone there or, or, or rather you can't have a victim necessarily, but society gets harmed by it. Mm -hmm. That's a victim. The person gets harmed by it by by having engaged in the drug, that's a victim. And in the same way in the sex industry, um, having people forced to do it or participating in it or whatever, um, participating in it creates victims all over the place. But we haven't we haven't come up with that. We haven't gotten to that point yet as a country to think like that. 
Mm. Right, right, Clarence, I totally quote. agree. I mean, it's that there are vic the victim is society. It's a crime <laughs> on society because it affects every avenue of society, even if people refuse or are blind to see it. And that's where, you know, I the one great thing is that, um, you know, as you said, 2006, human trafficking became illegal. Michigan was actually one of the first states to actually really push for a lot of human trafficking laws, which that's, you know, that's a great thing. Um, and we just have to graduate. That's what's important about education awareness. The more we can get out there and educate and bring awareness mm -hmm. to the subject mm -hmm. so that people can understand, then um, eventually we'll be able to get there. And that's the hope of it, is that we will get there. We've seen progress. I mean, you've just explained to us mm -hmm. the timeline of progress that we have mm -hmm. seen over the last, you know, 14 years. So, I mean, definitely hope we'll get there. Um, the sad part is we're going to have a lot of victims on the way. And, um, you know, and they're, the, they're, the, they're sacrificing themselves for us. And we have, a, in my opinion, a duty to step up and try to stop as many of those, you know, sacrifices as possible. And today, all of us here and everyone who's watching are taking the steps to stop that. So I think we should, you know, make sure we acknowledge by keep talking about it and telling people when you're you going out there sharing and when you become a you know when I think I think you become a judge Clarence we need people like you who understand who understand mm -hmm. these things. so um well, well I appreciate that and hopefully hopefully your words to God's ears uh that that happens um but yeah. you know one thing one thing that um you know, is important. Tracy, you made this point earlier, and and the three of you in this conversation do this every single day. Is education is going to be the only way that we really prevent this stuff from happening? I remember that we weren't even talking about trafficking, at least in my life, and and as a prosecutor, until the movie Taken came out. I remember when Taken came out, it kind of changed the whole ball game, and everyone got scared that you're going to be going to Europe and you're going to get kidnapped, mm -hmm. you're going to be taken away. Right, right. When the when the truth mm -hmm. is, the majority of trafficking doesn't happen like that. But right. most people, most people think that's what happens. And until we educate people, and all three of you do that every day, until we educate people to think, no, it's not just this extreme scenario where you know you're getting dragged under a bed outside of your room and mm -hmm. taking somewhere where you never mm -hmm. get found again. That's that's the only way people are going to normalize it. We have speakers. Uh, Tracy mentioned one. I, I don't know if it was during this call or not, but you know, Teresa Flores is somebody. The more you have people talking about it, the more we talk about it the more likely it's going to be that we come to a better legal result, whether it's decriminalizing or legalizing, mm -hmm. that we understand we understand it better, but people are still kind of afraid to talk about it. Yeah, that 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 was a huge uh I'm really mm -hmm. glad you said that because that was what I was gonna say next is like to continue the dialogue, please. Like this is something that needs to be talked about. It needs to keep being brought into the light rather swept away into the dark. You know, just because it may not necessarily be impacting you directly, it's really important to have these dialogues, um, just like the dialogues about pornography, just like the dialogues about internet safety. I mean, all these things with our kids, with our churches, with our businesses. You know, if anybody has a venue where they want to get educated, reach out, we'll come in. There's people who will go and speak and, and educate on these topics that aren't, you know, necessarily the easiest topics to talk about but are so important to keep on the forefront and to keep on in the light. Right. And we've got some resources, I believe. Um, you know, we'll post resources um, so that um, you can find some reliable information. Um, and we're going to continue this on the shelter orders through May 15th. So we kind of agreed we'll continue doing this each week while um, everyone's at home so we can still provide the education awareness to people while they're at home. I know May we talked about doing predator lures. So I look forward to uh start mm -hmm. thinking about that in the next next week. Um is, is there any like closing thoughts or ideas or were there any questions, Kendra? Nope, we've got a quiet crowd today, so no questions and no raised hands. Oh wait, I'm sorry. Nope, I did get one. Hang on, we got we got one that just came in. Um, let me pop this out because it's too small for me to read it. Um, when legislation is trying to be passed, shouldn't we be polling and asking survivors who have lived that life? 
Yeah, I think Emily made this point <laughs> earlier about testimonials and how that's oftentimes the most effective way. And sorry, Emily, I'm probably stealing your thunder right now. But, uh, you know, testimonials and anyway. how, how they matter. Um, I think they have to. The difficulty is, of course, who wants to come forward and talk. And, uh, you know, I remember when I was being trained as a new prosecutor, we, we I went to a seminar and we were sat in a room of like 300 people. And we were, they were trying to teach us how to talk to, you know, victims and survivors. And the first question they asked was, I want you to look at the person next to you and talk about the last time you had sex. And of course, that's like, who's going to do that? Everyone feels very uncomfortable with that. We can't mm -hmm. even do it with people who mm -hmm. haven't been victimized, let alone imagine what it's like to be the people who are going through it and think they're going to get prosecuted or think they're going to, you know, have mm -hmm. their family find out about it. Um, but I do think that the survivor role in this is a very important part of it. And mm -hmm. that will help move the ball forward. Absolutely. And then we did have one other comment that was um, that from from one of the, our attendees that they'd never met a prostitute who wasn't a victim at one point in her life. So, According to the something. research I've read, I can agree with that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, and, and there's other things. Go ahead. No, no, just a small point. You know, there's like a tree of crime that occur anytime someone's being trafficked. There's, you know, there's the crime itself of being trafficked, and then there's an abuse oftentimes that happens, and there's a drug aspect that happens to it, mm -hmm. then there's an unlawful imprisonment aspect. I mean, we're talking about several layers of crimes going on yeah. all at once just by the one act itself. Mm -hmm. And I, and I, I love what you had said, um, Clarence, that whenever there's illegal activity, there's always a victim. There's always a victim. There's always, you know, there's always something that someone's getting hurt, someone's getting impacted one way or another. So that that was a good point. Thank you. Yeah. That wraps up all of our questions. Um, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, for, and thank you for everybody for attending today's Cup of Hope panel. For more information about our guest panelist, Clarence Das, you can visit the DasLawFirm.com. We appreciate your time and hope that you found it valuable. Once you leave today's webinar, you'll receive a survey on the presentation. We would appreciate it if you would complete that and provide your feedback. You will also receive a follow-up email within 24 to 48 hours with a link to view a recording of today's webinar. On behalf of Hope Against Trafficking and the Michigan Abolitionist Project, thank you for joining us today and have a great rest of your day. Thank you so much, Clarence. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.